my title changed a little bit, and um, I will be talking about Barnard Star as an analog for Titan-like exoplanets. So I'm Ryan Felton, I'm a graduate student at Catholic University in DC, and I do my research at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And I first want to lay out some ground, lay out some reasons for why we should care about Titan in, the, in regards to the search for life. So as of now, we have about 4,000 exoplanets that we've detected. And, as, and since we believe every star has at least one planet, that means as telescope capabilities and mirror size increase over the next years and decades, then the number of planets we have, number of exoplanets that we have available to us to study is going to expand exponentially. And Titan with its very rich organic atmosphere and pro probably lifeless planet or lifeless moon means that we can use this to study and compare against exoplanets we find in the future when we're trying to look for that Earth 2.0. Essentially, we're going to need to separate the lifeless from the life-bearing or habitable ones. And Titan is a perfect place to find out more about what those exoplanets may look like. So if we see something that looks like a Titan-like exoplanet, we can potentially remove it from this whole huge catalog of exoplanets. And in the same vein, learning about Titan can also tell us more about our own planet's history, specifically the prebiotic period of Earth. In the same way that by learning about the prebiotic Earth, then any potential prebiotic type planets we find that are rocky, potentially Earth size, we can also filter out from that huge catalog while looking for Earth 2.0. Background for Earth and Titan, just to kind of get you familiar. I know you've already seen some Titan stuff in the previous talks. The big takeaway I want you to get from this is on Earth we have liquid water, on Titan we have liquid methane. It's so cold that the methane is actually condensing and falling out of the atmosphere. And then, of course, on Earth we have dragons in Game of the Thrones. On Titan we have Dragonfly, the gyrocopter that's going to be. Uh, going in about 2026. And so are there any Titan-like exoplanets out there? Well, last year, uh, detections were done for Barnard Star. This is a system about six light years away. And radio velocity detections showed evidence for a candidate planet called Barnard Star B. So the radio velocity me detection method is simply, if you have a star by itself, it's going to rotate around its own center of mass, which will right, be right down its axis. Once you add in a planet or a number of planets, the center of mass is going to shift. And so then the star will actually orbit that center of mass. And as it shifts, based on the geometry of the observer, you're going to have the star moving away and towards you, causing a Doppler shift. And from that Doppler shift, you can actually pick out a planet. And many exoplanets that we've already discovered were actually found this way. This is one of the top ways. So back to Barnard Star B, this is about 0.4 AU from its host star. And that may sound pretty close considering we're 1 AU from a G class. Barnard Star is M, so that means it's going to be putting out less energy. And so you can be closer in and it still be pretty cold. And that's one of the reasons we believe this may be a Titan-like exoplanet, because even though it's 0.4 AU away from its star, it's still far enough away that it's probably along the snow line. And so that led our group to ask, well, could we actually image this with a big space telescope? And I'm now just going to go through the process that we did to answer that question. So first off, you're going to need a big telescope specifically something on the range of probably 15 meters. So this is LUVRAR. It's the Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope. It's an Astro 2020 Decadal Survey design concept. So this has not been prioritized or anything like that. If anything, when it does, if it is prioritized and launched, it wouldn't launch until about 2040. But as I said, it's a 15 meter. This is LUVRAR A. There's also LUVRAR B version, which is a nine meter. And here's just a size reference, too, so you can see you've got Hubble, James Webb, and LUVAR. So it's a pretty big telescope. Now, LUVAR has a whole slew of instruments on it, one of them being Eclipse. This is its coronagraph and direct imaging instrument. And that's what will allow you to actually directly image the planet. 
And this uh, image here at the bottom left is an actual simulation of LUVOIR looking at our solar system uh, 13 parsecs away. And sure enough, you can see Earth, you can see Earth, Venus, and Jupiter right there. So that's where you're actually directly imaging. You can see it, where the coronagraph has blocked out the light, and you can see the planets. So the idea was then to take these tools and parameters and apply them to a web interface called the Planetary Spectrum Generator. This is a synthetic spectra uh, simulator. It's created by Geronimo Villanova. If you want to check the website out, you can actually go to the link right now or write it down and check out later, just PSG. And it gives you a whole slew of templates that you can pick from. These are planet templates. And you can go in and edit them, play around with them. You can even create your own and load them up and run them to create your spectra. And you can do things like play around with the geometry. These are just some screenshots where you can You've got uh, target geometry that you can adjust. You can also mess around with atmospheric profiles. So on the left, this is just a pressure temperature profile for a random template that I took a screenshot of. And then on the right, you've got the uh, altitude or pressure versus the abundance. And in this one, you can see there's a whole slew of gases that were put in there. And you can remove these, you can add them, you can change the profile shape, anything you want. And so what we did was make a very simplified Titan with just nitrogen and methane. As we saw in the earlier talks, those are main, uh, the main pieces of Titan's atmosphere. And we needed to validate the template we created first before we moved on to Barnard Star. And so we took observational data from back in the 90s with the ground based, and then this century with the Cassini Huygens mission, and collected that data together and compared it against our spectra. And these are the first results. So this is a reflectance spectrum plot. On the y axis, you've got the albedo. You can think this just as the shininess, this is the light reflecting off of the planet. And then the x-axis is just the wavelength. It's the light at whatever wavelength you're talking about. And we have the PSG, or the planetary spectrum, data in blue. And then a combination of the ground and space-based in orange. And then you can see the methane spikes here. These are also thought of as the methane windows. You can actually see down into tight surface through these. And it matches fairly well. And another validation we did was looking at the transit. So Ty Robinson took some of the trans took some of the Titan data and analyzed that at a point where Titan was actually passing between Cassini and the Sun. So that meant the Sun's starlight was passing through Titan's atmosphere, and you could read it as though you would read it as transit. And that's what we did here, same thing. We set it up and plotted our data against some of Ty's observations. Now, there are a few places where it's a little off, and I wanted to first just point those out before we move on to the next part. So around three microns, there is this region where the PSG spikes, but there's no spike in the actual data. And we believe that that's just due to missing ammonia and ethane. The idea is that if those species were added to our profile, then this spike would drop back down. And then in another region around one micron, you can see here where the amplitude of some of the peaks don't match. And we believe that's actually due to missing HITRAN data. HITRAN is this high resolution transmission molecular database. This is a database of observed and calculated uh, uh, quantum mechanical and uh, solutions to these different molecules. And it's used for radiative transfer codes usually. So the idea is PSG would get this data and use it when it does its radiative transfer calculations. And sure enough, you can see around one micron, there's those two black bands where there's no data. And that matches fairly well with the peaks that had the different amplitudes in the previous plot. So the idea is if this, count, if this data was there, those peaks would match. Now these quantum mechanical solutions are fairly hard to solve for certain species and at certain wavelengths. And it essentially just becomes incredibly computationally expensive to solve it. So it's possible that we may not get these filled in anytime soon. And so once we were comfortable with the Titan we had created, we essentially just took it and moved it over to Barnyard Star's location, or to his host star, 
and put it where Barnard Star B is. And that's what I'm going to go through now. So these are our first initial results using a Titan, light, a Titan radius of about 2,500 kilometers. It's the same type of chart before where you've got reflectance on the y-axis and wavelength on the right. And you've got your methane peaks, and then the vertical bars are the noise that's created by a PSG. And then I've added a little bit of randomness to it. And this block here, this essentially shows where you think this is what LUVAR would be able to see. So you get a little bit into the visible and some into the IR. Now what if you want to play around with the radius? When you do really the radial velocity technique, you actually get a minimum mass. And there's mass radii relations that have been developed by YZ and Marcy. Uh, there's a paper from 2014 that you can use for rocky terrestrial planets. And so we applied that using the minimum mass calculated for Barnard Star B and got a radius of about 8,300 kilometers. So now the radius has increased close to four times. And sure enough, you can see that the noise bars drop drastically, expanding our region of detectability well into the infrared, all of the visible now part of the UV. And I just did the same thing again. I increased the mass a little bit more and got uh, 9,500 kilometers. So it says the radiuses have gone up a little bit and the noise bars have dropped a little bit more. And you still have about the same range. So now we can go back to that question that I posed earlier of when we, whether we can image a big, uh, whether we can image this planet with a big space telescope. The answer is a resounding yes. And really what I'd like you to walk away from this with, if there's anything, is that Titan-like exoplanets are characterizable with big space telescopes. And the next plans that we have for this are adding on more of the complex hydrocarbons to our profile to then increase the complexity of our spectra that we're generating. And that we can see what other possible gases we can detect with LUVAR. Uh, this is our group back home. I just want to give a shout out, and some of us are here in the crowd. We're a whole mix of photochemical modelers, uh, chemists, space policy, quantum mechanics. We have people that do clouds, so a very diverse group. And do you have any questions? Thanks again for a good talk. Oh, is this working? No, it's working this time. Uh, we have lots of time for questions. Great talk. Uh, I this is gonna sound like a dumb question. No, probably. please ask. Please. <laughs> so ask. is this so does the Louvoir, Does that use like the um, it's like a shield, so it like blocks out. All so the very, light? right. I can get back to it. Well, let's be clear. There's. So. This is a shield to help block. And then for blocking out the light from the stars that it would be looking at, that would be using a chronograph that's actually part of, that's on the telescope itself. There's also a possible idea of including the star shade. Who's, here, who's heard of star shade? Okay, so that's another idea is you would have the star shade, which would be a completely independent object or shade out in front of LUVAR and you know, staying in line with it while it's looking around. But this analysis does not include starshade. Hi. Um, did you look at the photochemical stability of a Titan atmosphere around Barnard Star? So this is all during the radio transistor. Um, I separately, so no. I separately am working on Titan using photochemical models. Um, and so it's possible that we'll probably at some point, once we get that template working, apply, we'll probably do a similar thing, plug all of those profiles into PSG and run it again. Um, but no, I haven't looked at any stability yet. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, you alluded to this a little bit, but I'm wondering what you think about the whole minimum mass issue for this, because it looks like the mass 
really, like the spectrum that you get really sensitively depends on mass. So how do you like get the inclination? So we don't know the inclination. That is something that maybe with future better observations you'd be able to get. But that, I mean, so we talk about this, the inclination, depending on the geometry, if you're looking at it like this and the star's orbiting this way, you're not going to get any shift. Well, depending on how it's tilted towards you, you're going to then start getting shift. And that's where the minimum mass comes in because then, uh, I believe it's just something like, uh, then you have the, the sign of the angle, of the inclination angle to help you get the minimum mass. So for this, actually, I was thinking about this when I was sitting down is, uh, what's stopping this from just being like something like a hot Jupiter or something or any kind of much larger non-terrestrial planet? And I believe it has to do with the fact that this, that Barnard Star has been studied for years, if actually, I think decades. They were looking for just this, they were shifting through this data for a pretty long time. And we thought we found a planet on a Barnard Star system before and it ended up not being true. I believe that what's constraining this to being a terrestrial planet is that it's not, we would have picked up some kind of transit or something else if it was larger. Then if it, because right now we're not really able to identify exoplanets that are that small with something like the transit method. So the fact that it hasn't transited, I believe is why, is one of the reasons that we can think it's still gonna be reduced in size. Hi, uh, great talk. Would we be able to study these planets with Louvoir B? No. Louvoir B had the mirrors too small. You have issues with resolving power in, in the inner working angle, and it's no. It wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to do this. All right, and I think it's about time. Uh, if you have any other questions for him, feel free to ask him during the break. Let's give him another hand.